Yeah, thank you for the nice introduction and uh, thanks everyone for your patience for waiting. And obviously, like this, the Waymo system have really like, high level of security in using uh, outside of like Google Waymo Alphabet apps, uh, Zoom, right? Um, so I'm excited uh, here to talk about the future of scaling autonomous driving. Um, so here, let's see, okay, trying to control it again, okay. Uh, so Waymo is the uh, autonomous driving uh, technology company uh, with the mission to build the world's uh, most uh, trusted driver. Um, and then like the Waymo driver makes it easy and safe uh, for people and things to get where they are going to. Um, so uh, driving today is still not uh, as safe uh, as it could be, uh, which is why safety is at the core of like Waymo's mission. Uh, so today like over 50 million injuries and uh, more than 1.3 million deaths worldwide happening. And actually like 50% of those deaths are actually pedestrians, uh, cyclists and motorcyclists. Um, and according to uh, some of the recent uh, definitive uh, NISA study, um, actually like a large portion of um, this uh, crashes in the US actually involve uh, the human as the critical factor, be it uh, speeding or be it distraction from uh, to our cell phones or be it like drowsiness due to like lack of sleep or um, the danger of uh, uh, junk. Um, so this actually, like, uh, we think the lesson uh, with all these um, studies is that like, how many lives can be saved and how many injuries and can be reduced um, by eliminating or reducing the, the human factors in driving. So in Waymo, like, we have been testing our technology um, over the years uh, with like, really the, the longest and also the toughest like, test. Uh, we have been driven um, the autonomously uh, over 20 million miles uh, uh, on the public roads and also like over 20 million, uh, 20 billion miles in simulation uh, across 13 uh, states of the US. And the Waymo experience like starts with like using the Waymo app. Like you can just like input the destination, like uh, confirming the details of your trip, uh, and then like just confirm, and then like the Waymo car will come to you. And then during your ride, um, uh, the uh, there was uh, we in the screen in the in car screen will show you uh, what the Waymo car is seeing and thinking, and uh, without over, over overloading you with too much information. And with that ease, like you can just uh, enjoy the peace and uh, enjoy the, the time back uh, in the car, uh, in the spatial car, uh, and then uh, just knowing what to expect in your ride. Uh, so then the way more experience uh, gets you, uh, just like makes you feel like uh, you are being there. So currently, like the, uh, we are operating uh, uh, autonomous driving in four cities regions, uh, including San Francisco, Phoenix, uh, LA, and Austin. And here I want to show you uh, some of the recent uh, situations we encounter. So here we are driving through some tunnels and you can see the pedestrian is walking reversely next to us and we are going around them nicely. So this is driving under a, a thunderstorm at night uh, across the intersection. And this is driving across the bridge uh, with the overhanging structures. And then right after that, uh, we meet a pedestrian a, a worker uh, guiding the traffic. And then like, we react to the sign and then walk around. And this is like, after U-turn, uh, we encounter construction zone. And then we again, we react to the sign and then like following the gestures of the construction worker. And then we decide to uh, go forward. And this is like we are driving in a very narrow, narrow street uh, in San Francisco. And then like, we need to na um, navigate between like the vehicles, like, including the open doors. Then we nudge nicely. Uh, but then like, at the same time, we are still also cautiously making progress uh, in this narrow region. Uh, so this is a busy intersection. So we are trying to make a left turn. And after we make the left turn and uh, we, we see a vehicle that is trying to reverse uh, into the driveway. Uh, so we yield to them. 
And also, like, um, because this is very dense traffic, we don't want to block other traffic. Whenever there's region enough for us to go around, we'll just confidently go forward. Uh, so over the past year, like we have been also like in, uh, when we try to scale the Waymo driver across like uh, the operating regions, uh, we are also trying to like increase our uh, abilities uh, to uh, handle more complex situations and also like expand into like new uh, operation regions. So one of them is on construction. Um, so as you can see from the video, actually like construction is difficult because like uh, the variance in its setup and also like it's a very dynamic uh, uh, situation. So in this video, like our car encounter uh, a construction worker holding a sign and then we uh, stop right away. Uh, and then the construction worker is walking away. We continue to stop and then we see the construction vehicle is trying to move uh, and pull over on the side. And then we see that the road gets opened up and there's enough region for us to pass by. And so we gradually slowly going forward. And at the same time, we also react to like, the gestures um, safely and confidently going forward. Uh, another complex situation is responding to uh, the emergency vehicles. So here we are driving on the street and we are approaching an intersection. And from the other side of the intersection, there's the emergency ambulance. So we just pull to the side, waiting for the, we see the flashing lights of the emergency ambulance and we wait for this car to go by uh, until we start to drive again. And this is another example, right? So we are driving in this tree and in the oncoming lane, there's a fire truck coming, flashing lights, um, and then we stop uh, to yield to the fire truck. So until the fire truck fully passed by, uh, we would go forward again. Uh, so this very last example, like uh, we meet an uh, incident scene, uh, which is now blocked by a police car. So we understand that like this row is blocked. Uh, so then uh, we now try to reverse and make a multi-point turn and get out of this row. And then like, so we will choose an alternative route uh, to go to our destination. So in addition to those uh, complex situations, we also expand our uh, ability a lot like in the new uh, uh, driving scopes. Uh, one of them is freeway. Uh, we have increased our um, capability on freeway a lot. So now we are driving on freeways autonomously. And so in this case, you can see that like, we can drive from the ramp and merge into the freeway. And we encounter vehicles stopping shoulder. We give the enough space and uh, using the right speed to pass them. And uh, we can also um, go from one freeway, going to ramp and then join into uh, the other freeway. And the next example would be like, yeah, driving at night. Like you can see that we even meet like a uh, fast moving like motorcyclist. Um, and also that like sometimes we will also have dense traffic and then we need to make our way to do the lane changes uh, without exiting wrongly. So that was the example we can do it. And now this one is at night, like we need to handle like construction or uh, incident scenes correctly, responding to the emergency responders. Um, and driving through the regions. Uh, last but not the least, like we also can exit the freeway, going to the ramp, but then you need to also start to pay even extra attention. Like for example, in this case, at night, there's a drive walker uh, close to the ramp, and then like, we, we stop uh, like in time, like very timely, and then react to them. So as I mentioned earlier, um, safety is at the core of our mission. Uh, and then uh, we really believe that the transparency uh, around safety is paramount for the future um, and also like the acceptance of the AV technology. Um, so this is why like in the last couple of years that like, we have been very actively sharing um, the uh, not just like the, the information about our approach to safety, but also the real uh, driving performance data. 
So we publish like multiple uh, studies that provide a growing body of evidences uh, showing that like the, uh, the Waymo driver's safety benefits. Um, actually, in particular, our most recent study over the 7 million uh, plus uh, rider-only miles actually showed that like, the Waymo driver uh, can reduce 85% um, of, like, can cause 85% like, of reduction in uh, injury crash crashes rates and also like, leads to uh, 57 more reduction to the um, police uh, reported uh, crashes rates. Um, so as I mentioned, like uh, when we scale, right? So that's um, it's really critical and important uh, to to handle the long tail events. So here, like I would like to show a few out of distribution uh, rare events we have encountered on the road. So one of the cases here is that like basically a BBQ grill, like actually falling from the back of a pickup truck at a really high speed. Uh, so the next here is that like uh, we actually encounter a house in Lake which very abnormal. Um, the third one is that like, we actually see a construction worker walking across freeway uh, with the sign, uh, with, uh, they're carrying a sign uh, which occluded a large part of their body. Um, so here, like, uh, so because long tail uh, handling is so critical for the scaling, over the years like, in Waymo, we have developed uh, many technologies for long tail handling. Um, this includes like uh, the multimodality center fusion, which is to leverage like the complementary uh, benefits from different sensor uh, data, uh, including camera, lidar, radar, and we also invest into uh, different approaches to uh, mine and augment the rare examples, and uh, we develop different approaches for auto labeling, which can uh, significantly increase the number of data we can use for training. Uh, and we also like develop the efficient ML ecosystem, which can help us to really iterate and uh, and and improve our system uh, very fast. So then, I uh, what's the next? Right. Um, I think uh, in this current period, like uh, as we can all see, like seeing what's happening in generative AI, uh, it's hard for anyone to ignore it, right? Uh, so today, like the current generative AI tech um, is uh, the most mature in the language domain, but it's also evolving uh, very fast uh, for multimodalities. And um, in the next, like, in order to scale to more, uh, to scale to uh, handling more long tails, we also want to leverage um, the knowledge and reasoning capabilities in LLM and VLM um, for driving. So here shows some examples. Uh, the left side, I think this example is pretty uh, popular on the web, right? So uh, you give one of like the chatbots like uh, this image like, which contains like, a, a multiple of the signs about parking on this row and ask them that like, it's Wednesday at 4 p.m. Can I park at this spot right now? And tell me in one line. And then they will answer that like, okay, you can park for up to one hour uh, starting from st starting at 4 p.m. And another example here is that we give this image and give like this poem uh, to another chatbot, uh, asking them that what's happening, what should I pay attention to, and uh, and also why. And the chatbot will tell you that like yeah, pay attention to the overturned car, pay attention to the uh, emergency responders, and also the traffic. Uh, you should like slow down and uh, be patient, follow the instructions, and also like uh, look for alternative route. And then the reason is for safety and efficiency. So you can see here that like actually like the the, the existing LM VLM models actually show pretty uh, promising uh, potentials for us like, to handle abnormal situations like this. And so in the following, I'm going to uh, show you a few of our the recent works in Waymo uh, that try to leverage uh, LM VLM for autonomous driving. Uh, so the first paper I'm talk going to talk about is unsupervised 3D perception with 2D vision language distillation for autonomous driving. This was a paper from ICCV last year. Uh, so the motivation of this paper is, like, uh, as we know, that like, many of the current uh, perception technologies rely on sophisticated network and requires like, heavy human annotation. Uh, so the annotations we have are usually a closed set of predefined categories. Right. Um, so, however, the cross set um, uh, uh, approach like, have drawbacks, such as like uh, human labeling uh, can be slow, can be inefficient, can be expensive, and also limited to the predefined categories. 
So self-driving cars actually needs to handle a really dynamic scene. Uh, as Waymo scales up, we have covered more and more cat object categories and situations, but still anything can happen on the road, right? Uh, so therefore, like, we actually, like, um, this may not scale, right? This, this um, uh, predefined categories may not scale. So thus, we desire open vocabulary uh, approach uh, that can localize and recognize objects uh, of any arbitrary objects. Uh, and also with the like, hopefully with very little to uh, even no labor intensive efforts uh, for scaling up. So as shown in the recent research, um, such ability of uh, open vocabulary perception on 2D images can be obtained uh, from the large language um, vision language models pre-training. So these models are trained with billions of image text pairs uh, from the web. And they have shown grow a great uh, generalization abilities to many vision tasks from classification, segmentation to visual question answering. So then uh, how can we extend uh, such open vocabulary capability to uh, the 3D modeling? So thanks to um, our calibrated sensors installed on the car, uh, we can unproject the pair wise, the, the unproject the pixel wise um, features which encodes the open vocabulary semantics into the 3D point cloud. So we then we can develop a method that utilizes these projective features together with any other signals to obtain a 3D uh, work open vocabulary perception system. Um, so this is the proposed uh, design of the, the approach uh, of, the, of the paper. And uh, it evolves uh, to it includes like a two stage training process that relies on knowledge uh, distilled from uh, 2D vision language models. So the first stage involves uh, the unsupervised multi model auto labeling, uh, where the pixel wise features uh, obtained from a pre trained vision language model are then uh, unprojected into the point wise features uh, using like the camera models. And this enables also enables a proposal of bounding boxes uh, for the objects of interest. So this is shown as this uh, the bottom part of this graph. And then uh, uh, in the second stage, as uh, shown in the upper part of the graph, uh, it actually involves uh, feeding the point-wise features and also the auto-label bounding boxes um, for train to the object detector for training. So besides the detection losses, uh, we also use like the distribution losses like to preserve uh, the open vocabulary semantics uh, in the detector uh, parameters. So during the inference stage, we just use the text decoder um, uh, in that text encoder, and then like, uh, from this like uh, pre-trained VLM model, um, and then to prompt or to query uh, for any of the desired uh, objects. So. Um, what sets this detector apart like from other previous works is that like we can actually like uh, handle um, um, object category outside of a predefined uh, set of objects. So the query is encoded and then compared with the pointwise features output by the 3D detector, and then this enables us to identify which objects uh, belong to the query categories. So know that at the inference time, we actually don't need any of the camera inputs. And also the only sensor input like, to, the, to, the, to the detector is just the point cloud. Uh, so this shows the result. Um, so here, like, the, um, our approach can actually like, uh, pre pretty faithfully um, detect the objects of interest based on like, the user uh, provided text prompts. And you can see that like actually we can detect objects of like quite some of like the fine grain categories such as like bulldozer, uh, UPS truck, um, and uh, fire truck, traffic cones, trash trash bins, and so on. So the entire training process here in this approach like is free of three D uh, annotations. So the second paper I'm going to talk about is Motion LM, which is also like presented from my CCV last year. Um, so in this paper, uh, we explore a motion prediction model inspired by the current LLMs. So we treat the agents as participants in a constant dialogue, continuous exchanging actions and reactions and uh, mirroring the fluidity of conversations. So just as today's language models uh, that can capture sophisticated distributions over conversations, 
So the question we are trying to ask is that like, can we leverage uh, the sequence models to also forecast the behaviors of the row agents? So this work uh, propose, uh, follows the parallels uh, with the languages and this criticizes uh, the set of possible agents uh, motions into uh, the motion tokens and models the full joint distribution of these tokens. So then we can producing, uh, so then we can produce the full joint trajectories as it is like all the participants uh, talking to each other in a conversation. Uh, so this is the proposed architecture of motion LM. So on the left, like, we have the initial scene encoder, uh, which use it, utilize like, the multimodal uh, sensor inputs, like, including like, row graph and also like, any of the uh, outputs like, uh, from perception uh, based on different sensors. And then we have like, this autoregressive uh, transformer decoder. Um, this decoder, which performs like the cross attention to the scene encoding, and also performs like the cell attention uh, to the motion tokens along the way. So here is how it works. Uh, the decoder samples the distributions of uh, for multiple agents. Here we shows two agents. Like one is in the green color, one is in the uh, blue color. Um, and then like, we sample the tokens, and then we feed them back uh, to the decoder. Uh, and then we sample the that again and just keep going, right? So now at the very end, like usually for a prediction, a behavior prediction task, we usually need to output like a, a certain number of uh, uh, trajectory with, with probabilities. So what we do is that like, we just need to sample a really large set of trajectories and then we can cast them, like use some simple approaches to cast them into the desired K um, uh, trajectories. And then at the inference time, like we iteratively uh, just sample the outputs in a temporal causal way. So as you can see here, you just roll out these features, like given the context of a set of like motion tokens um, in the past, and then like we predict the next token, uh, token of each agent. Uh, and then you take all these tokens and then they roll out the future. And usually you can also sample several futures. Uh, and then you predict a distribution of probabilities of these futures. So here shows the example that like, uh, like on the right side is our causal uh, joint prediction. So comparing to the marginal prediction, uh, because we are jointly optimizing like all the agents at the same time, taking considering all their past tokens. So you can see here that like um, the, the new result is avoiding the collision between uh, the two agents, which is a more realistic uh, behavior prediction output. And beyond that, we also have the qualitative result of the motion LM approach uh, comparing to like the previous day of R, it performs comparable um, on uh, all the metrics and also like performs better on especially two of the metrics like misray and MAP, uh, which ensures usually like the more uh, long tail behaviors. And with that, I'm going to talk about also like the, uh, the last approach, uh, which is uh, last paper, which is the multimodality scene tokenization for motion prediction. Uh, so this is actually a, a CVPR paper this year, and uh, the paper will also be presented in the next couple of days. Uh, so in this paper, so the motivation is that like, I think it's also uh, mentioned related to uh, what Nick just mentioned in the previous talk, like many of the existing motion prediction models uh, consumes the representations public, uh, produced by perception and uh, in a symbolic uh, format, such as like the oriented 3D bounding boxes uh, encoding the states of all the objects. And this representations, like it reduced the input dimensionality um, it makes like the downstream models like it can uh, uh, oh, oh, the downstream models can be a uh, lighter weight, um, but at the same time like, and at the same time like this kind of models are all this kind of outputs are also very easy to um, to 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 rearrange and manipulate it. so such that like um, making it very possible to uh, construct uh, hypothetical scenes uh, during like simulation or other testing, so this is very popular use right. But relying entirely on the outputs of like the symbolic the symbolic outputs of the perception models can also result in like more uh, fragile uh, behavior prediction. So, um, for example, like some of the perception models that like it may fail to uh, detect the novel obstacles that haven't been seen uh, in training or haven't been labeled in training, and 
uh, because of that, like, so the, the behavior prediction, if you only react to the symbolic outputs, like, uh, you may not like create the right uh, uh, prediction. And at the, on the other hand, like, as we have talk, touched the topic multiple times today, like end-to-end uh, -end system uh, can actually train on like the uh, raw sensor data can actually better handle some of these cases because like they can um, encode like some of the open vocabulary information. Um, but at the same time, like uh, the end to end uh, approach also have like their own challenges. Uh, for example, like um, it can trigger a more significant uh, computational cost, or um, it will lose out like some of the interpretability uh, along with the uh, modularity. So here, the approach here like is uh, we, can, we are trying to answer the question that like can we design a system that can enjoy the merits of both the end-to-end -end approach and also the modular uh, paradigms. So this is the proposed uh, paradigm uh, the paper has. Uh, as shown in the graph here, um, so uh, the the approach is trying to fuse uh, both the symbolic outputs right, from the normal perception system and also introduce like the multimodality scene tokens. Uh, while the symbolic outputs like um, it offers a convenient wall abstraction, um, the multimodality scene tokens actually links the behavior models uh, to the more uh, denser observations uh, in the raw sensor data. So here, like we what, what we propose here is to tokenize the visual world uh, into a compact set of scene elements. Uh, and then leveraging the pre-trained VLM models uh, and also the LIDAR neural networks, uh, we can encode all the scene elements in an open, open vocabulary manner. Um, the pre-trained uh, VLM models uh, helps us to encode the general information of the world, while the LIDAR networks can help us to like, continue to keep the geometric information. And here as shown uh, in this graph, uh, the primary contribution of this approach uh, is a method to really tokenizing uh, the multimodality self-driving scenes. Uh, so to process the raw sensor data, uh, we use the pre-trained model, VRM model, to encode like a surrounding camera views, and which are then like unprojected into the 3D point cloud. And then we also encode the bounding boxes and also like other LiDAR point geometrics um, uh, together and also like pull all types of features and then into one token uh, to represent each of the scene element. So here shows some quantitative result of this approach. Um, so this approach that we uh, abbreviate here as like, most comparing to like, the other existing approach, for example, the original waveformer, it has shown uh, better performance across all the metrics. And here is also an example of the correlative result. As you can see here on the uh, right side is the original waveformer result, which consumes only the symbolic perception outputs. So therefore, it doesn't take like, the enough information about the wall next to the row. And it uh, produces a trajectory, which in blue, like the car can actually do a U-turn. Uh, battery on the left, like because we on uh, the the new paper, the paper we are publishing, like also like takes into account the raw sensor data, so it helps them to it helps the model to identify that like we cannot uh, take a U-turn here, so that like we can avoid uh, hitting into the wall. And last but not the least, uh, we also evaluate the performance of this model uh, by uh, injecting perception failures and also um, the row graph failures. So as shown here, um, so the performance is actually on par with the original waveform baseline, even in the case of like having a 50% perception failures or 30% row graph failures. So this shows that like uh, the more with the with the open vocabulary manner, we actually help to um, like um, tackle the situations that are when missing the symbolic representations of the perception outputs or row graphs. 
Uh, so with that, like I've shown like some of these papers, like this actually shows our promise of like uh, the LLM VLM, like shows the promise of LLM VLM for uh, autonomous driving. But at the same time, like I think we still have many questions to tackle in this space. So some of the examples include like, for example, what is the best uh, VLM architecture for autonomous driving? For autonomous driving, like different from like the normal um, Gen AI problems trying to handle, like we actually, um, like features that like we need to take a lot of temporal inputs, that like we have like more abundant sensor modalities, not just uh, camera, but also LiDAR cam uh, radar. And also we need to perform like spatial reasoning. So these are the unique uh, properties of self-driving and what should be the right foundational model architecture for this uh, autonomous applications is still an open question. And beyond that, like, there's also the open question that uh, how do we reconcile uh, the current, um, but I will see representation with the uh, language base, scene descriptions, and how can we enable more of chain of the saw along the way. And beyond that, like, there's also more questions, uh, including like the language condition um, planners, and also like how can we preserve like LM, VLM capabilities given the very limited compute on the car. So there's many, many more uh, questions uh, that we need to answer. And then like, we actually think that like, this, this industry is evolving very fast and we want to invite all of you like, to join us to explore the space. And to conclude the talk, like, I want to show this video um, just to give everyone a relaxing moment. So this video is actually sharing like the riders of the Waymo One service. Um, how they feel about the service and how passionate and exactly they feel about riding the car. How's the Waymo? Here's my Waymo. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. <laughs> there is no one in the front. Hi! Hi. Hi. <laughs> Check out our driver. <laughs> how do you feel so far in this car? thing that surprised me was just how peaceful it feels and how fast I got used to it. My favorite thing about riding in a Waymo is I can be as dressed up as I want and no one's going to ask where I'm going. Riders it's better than Disneyland. <laughs> hey, we have no driver! <laughs> you guys even see this? <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. So uh, with that, uh, we also want to uh, welcome. Uh, we also want to welcome everyone to try out the Waymo card uh, when you drop by the operating regions. And we uh, in Waymo, we look forward to continue improving this autonomous technology and then make it uh, available for more cities. Uh, this concludes my talk. Uh, thank you. <laughs>